Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to Riskified. I cannot tell you how excited about welcoming all of you to Riskified and how excited I am to talk about a topic that's really, really important to me and very close to my heart. So I know that the general wisdom is to start with like a fun fact or a cliffhanger, but I'm going to start with my introduction, because if not, you're going to spend 10 minutes thinking where that accent comes from. So the accent is from Hungary. I'm originally Hungarian, but I've been in Israel 13 years, so it's kind of a mix of Hungarian and Hebrew accent in, in English. And I've been at Whiskeyfied for almost six years now in a lot of different positions. I was in the fraud intelligence team, and right now I am in the data science department. Uh, but I think what's important for you to know about me and the reason that I'm going to be talking about this is that in addition to Riskified, I have over 10 years experience working and volunteering for NGOs and nonprofit organizations in a lot of different subjects. So really, ever since I was a teenager, I have been volunteering. And I have been very lucky that through volunteering, I have found a lot of, lot of meaning and a lot of uh, importance to what I am doing. And I have also found a lot of meaning in making the world a better place. And that is something that I am uh, very happy that I can bring to my work, and it's something that I can also focus in my day-to-day -day job in high tech. So, uh, in order to understand what we are going to talk about, I need to give you a little bit of an introduction to both e-commerce and to fraud. So, um, as Ben mentioned earlier, Riskified works with fraud uh, prevention in the e-commerce world. Now, I am sure that everyone in this room has bought something online, especially in these post-corona years. We are all very familiar with how e-commerce works from the customer side, right? You have all purchased stuff online. Um, not a lot of people, especially people who don't work in fintech, know what happens behind the scenes. So actually, when you click on the purchase button, a lot of players are starting to communicate, and a lot of players are trying to stop a fraudulent order from being fulfilled. One of the players will be the gateway, the entity who talks, who communicates between your bank and the merchant's bank. Uh, one of the entity will be your bank, also doesn't want a fraudulent order to go through. And the third entity will be the merchant. Not everyone knows that if a fraudulent order goes through, the entity who is liable for that amount of money is the merchant. Now, that means that the merchants are uniquely motivated in not approving fraudulent order. Another thing to know about merchants is that they are not that great at fraud review, at least not all of them. And they are also not that interested in this because they are interested in their product. They want to make better and more product. They are interested in marketing, in sales. So what do they do? They outsource. So this is where Riskify steps in. Instead of the merchants, we do their fraud review for them. As Ben mentioned earlier, we also give a guarantee, which means that if we approve fraudulent orders, we are liable for that chargeback. OK? Now, how does fraud work in the e-commerce world? It's very easy. The, fraud, the fraudster has some kind of stolen payment method. They place an order with that stolen payment method. They get that order approved, they receive the product, they resell the product, and they're rich. They pay rent, you know, they buy a car, whatever. Now, there are a lot of places and a lot of stops in this flow where I could stop and talk about, but I want you to think about two important steps. First, where does the froster get the stolen payment method from? And second, how do they get approved? Okay? Because a lot of people think that fraud is this, you know, teenager in their hoodie, working out of their parents' basement at 2 a.m. doing, like, fraud. But that is not the case anymore. Uh, E-commerce fraud is one of the biggest branches of organized crime, making tens of billions of dollars a year. It's really a huge business. And as a business, it really is a business. The Froster community is very close-knit, it's very active, they have chat groups, 
they have forums, they have tutorials, they have you know step-by-step -step tutorials, and they have bot farms, you know, for rent or for buying. They have starter kits for you to buy if you are really new to the fraud world and want to you know do your first fraud at home. So they are they are very organized. You can buy malwares. It's not anymore, you know, that hacker that sits in the dark to do it. I'm going to show you some examples. Um, these are dark web uh, screenshots. Here, for example, you see an account uh, being sold with name, address, phone number, user agent, meaning what kind of computer or phone you're usually browsing from, of course, together with the login and password of the said account. Second, this is a tutorial on how to, do, how to make thousands a day uh, with Apple Pay carding. And third, this is a list of tutorials and resources for someone who is just getting started in the fraud world. Don't worry, the presentation will be available for you after. Don't need to copy the links right now. But really, I want you to understand how much information is available for them. Now, the two questions I asked before. How does the fraudster get the stolen payment method? How, does, how do they get the stolen credit cards? A lot of people think that they get it by hacking banks or hacking credit card companies. Now, sometimes they do that, but those are actually the players in this universe who have a lot of legal responsibility to be very safe. You know who doesn't have any legal responsibility to be safe? You. When you're browsing the web, you are clicking on stuff you shouldn't, you are downloading stuff you really shouldn't, and you are behaving incredibly irresponsible. Okay? So when you are doing that, you are downloading exactly these malwares, exactly the, these malicious uh, programs, and they are running on your computer. Okay? Why is that important? It's important because once you are the weak link who gets the, pay, uh, the credit card number to the frosters, you are not only giving the credit card number to them, you are giving your Facebook account, you are giving your Google history, you are giving them your TikTok account, you are giving an incredible amount of personal information together with your credit card number. And now why is that important? It's important when we ask the question, how do the frosters get approved? As I said, there are a lot of players in the e-commerce workflow who are trying to stop fraud from being approved. If there are a lot of players, then you need to be smart if you want to make millions, billions of dollars, which means they need, need to be sophisticated, okay? Simple fraud is not really a good business anymore. So they need to be sophisticated. How are they sophisticated? Well, first of all, they are sophisticated in the way that they use that personal data that they collect to do fraudulent orders with your credit card that's believable. For example, with my credit card, they are going to buy, you know, high-tech pet, pet toys uh, because they know that I spend a lot of money on that, and there is no bank that will flag that as suspicious. Meanwhile, if they try to buy construction materials, a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of banks would be like, that's not really her usual behavior. That's one way. And the other way is, that once they have a lot of information about you, they know your age, they know your gender, they possibly know your sexual orientation, your race, do you have kids, how much money you have, what are you searching on Google, they can target you to become more victimized in more sophisticated fraud schemes, okay? So who are these groups that they are targeting? Um, so based on this research from the FTC, the Federal Trade Committee in America from 2017, African-American and Hispanic minorities are much more likely to become victims of fraud than, uh, than white communities. Important to, to mention here that the FTC is not only looking at credit card fraud uh, or e-commerce fraud, what Whiskify deals with, it looks at every kind of fraud and scams um, that there is. Um, such as like fake weight loss scams. So that's also included here, but you see that the African-American and Hispanic community is more likely to become victims. Question is, why are they more likely? If you look at the, the survey 10 years ago, this is the same result, it's just 
a better quote from that uh, research, is that the African American and the Hispanic community are significantly more likely to become victims, but this significance, this difference even disappears once you adjust for age, for educational level, and for uh, financial situation. This also explains, if you remember in the previous slide, we saw that the Asian American community is less likely to become. It's because their educational situation is significantly better than that of the black or Latino community in the US. So this also shows, which I think is very important, and I really want you to focus on this, that the reason that these racial minorities are more targeted deeply connects to their other social situation that we see in society. It, all the other ways that they are discriminated connects to this and makes them more likely to become victims of fraud um, and scams. So for example, if you look at how your financial situation impacts uh, your chances of becoming a victim, you see that if you have more debt than you are comfortable with, which means you, your financial situation is very bad, then you are twice as likely to become a victim as if your financial situation is comfortable. Means that all of those differences that we see in between the racial groups very much connects to their financial standing in society. Another thing that we saw is education. So education is really the key in helping these communities, both general education and fraud-specific fraud education. And what happens is, that the black and Latino communities are underserved by the authorities in these efforts to teach them about scams. You can see it here that, for example, if you ask them the average number of scams ever, imagine this question like someone asks you, like, have you ever heard of the Nigerian prince scam? Most of us in this room have, so that would be like one scam ever, okay? So we see that uh, the Latino and black communities are on average know about one less scam. Now, if you don't know about the scam, you're more, more likely to become a victim. Another important point is that they're more likely to behave in risky ways. For example, answering calls from someone who you don't know, which I think we don't really do anymore, but there are people who do it, is one of the riskiest behavior that you can, and one of the behavior that most predicts you becoming a victim of a scam or fraud. Um, and you can see, that the black community, for example, is significantly more likely to answer such calls than the white community. Very interesting to see that it's not true for the Latino community. This is because the Latino community, because of you know, immigration situation in the US, is very, very wary of the authorities and very wary of phone calls that are coming in, either for themselves or their family or their friends. So they are not going to answer phone calls that they don't know about. Another thing they are not doing is they are not reporting the frauds and scams that they have been victims, which means that communities that have at least half of them is Latino are significantly less likely to report any kind of um, fraud and scam that they have been victim of, which means that these fraudsters are allowed to continue operating the community and are allowed to continue victimize all of these people. So that has been a lot of numbers and a lot of depressing sounds. So what we are going to do now is we are going to listen to a call, an actual call between Risky Five and someone who has been a victim of such fraud. And uh, she's going to explain to you what happened. And now I really hope I can make this play and that we can hear it. Hi, I'm calling in order to verify a dispute you recently filed with your bank. Okay, let me tell you the whole story of that day, and it may help you understand more. Y yes, please. Microsoft called me, and they needed to clean up my computer. It would cost me $5. So I gave them my American Express number. It wasn't maybe an hour, two hours later. I get two different phone calls. One where somebody was trying to put a charge on Amazon.com, and then another one was to Target. I said, don't help. I've not been to Target. Besides that, Target's quite a ways from my home. And so I got suspicious. Well, there's something going on. So I called Microsoft, because I've got a number straight to them, 
to log in and everything. I called Microsoft, and they told me, no, 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 it wasn't us. Yeah, I understand. So basically, the people that called you, they claimed to be representing Microsoft, and then... But they weren't. But they and weren't. They said they would never call me, yes. but I have to call them. Yes, and these people that called you, did they take control of your computer? Did they use your computer somehow? Yes, yes, because I thought it was Microsoft, and you know how you give them your code and everything. Yes, I did, hon. Right. Okay, so basically they were using your computer and they placed orders in Target and Amazon using your credit cards and, and they... I don't know how they did that. I don't know how they did that. Yeah. But they had to take my credit card. I mean, they had it. I gave it to them. I'm, but now all that's changed. Yes. And what did you say was the usage for them? They said they want to clean up viruses from your computer? Yes, said I had quite a few errors. I understand. Okay, thank you so much for your cooperation. This was very helpful for... So, the two reasons that I wanted you to listen to this is, one, it's very important to personalize these victims. It's very important for me to listen to these people because once you listen to them, you remember that we are not just, they are not just numbers, they're not just orders that you approve or decline in the system. These are actual people. This person that we listen to, this lovely lady that we listen to, lost tens of thousands of dollars in this fraud. That's probably her retirement money. That's probably her whole you know, income for a year or 10 years for the rest of her life, okay? Thankfully, she got it back from the bank, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But these are actual people that are becoming victims. The second reason I wanted to listen is, and I knew that this is going to happen. Okay, um, is because there's an, another very important factor in who becomes victim, and that is age. You can see that with age, people are losing more and more, significantly more money on average and the median once they become victims of fraud such as this lady who was in her 70s, they lost a, she lost a lot of money, okay? Usually when young people become victims, when they do become victims, they are losing much less money, okay? So, why are minorities overrepresented amongst victims? Um, to summarize what we have been talking about, one, they have less educational opportunities, both specific uh, fraud education and general education. I have to say that corona made fraud so widespread that right now in the US there is a lot of effort to target these communities and to teach them more about all the frauds that they are targeted by. Second is the variant mistrust of authority and institutions. Third, with age is true for the elderly. There is a lowering of cognitive abilities. They understand less of what's going on. Third, there is a shame in reporting, and also, especially for us in the LGBT community, uh, you need to be outed. A lot of times, the LGBT community is um, attacked through dating apps. We just talked about dating apps. There are a lot of scams going on on Grindr. So if you want to go to the police, you need to start with, I was on Grindr. And if you are not out, or if you are in a country where you, are not, you cannot safely be out, you're not going to report it, allowing the fraudsters to continue operating. And finally, financial insecurities. When you are in a bad financial situation, you cannot listen to your God. Things that are too good to be true are still have to be done. You know, you are going to buy that stuff for $5 instead of $25, because that $20 difference is your weekly dinner budget. So you, are not, you just cannot allow yourself to be like, oh, this is too good to be true. So this is one side of the coin. I want to show you another side of the coin, which is very important for us in Riskify, which is minorities in our data. So minorities, by definition, our definition are minorities, which means they are a smaller part of your data than the majority, okay? A lot of times, they behave differently than the majority. I'll give you a couple examples here. For example, imagine a Tel Avivi who goes to New York and buys 15 iPhones. We all know what's happening, right? There are 15 friends on Facebook who were like, yo, can you bring me an iPhone back when you come back, right? So we're all like very familiar with this pattern. If he wasn't 
a tourist, and if he wasn't Israeli, this would be very suspicious behavior. Why are you buying 15 iPhones? But in this case, we all understand what happened, right? So he behaves differently, but it's actually legitimate. I'll give you another example also from Riskified Word, which is our gibberish generator. We have all kinds of internal scripts that are running, trying to understand whether a name is gibberish, like just someone, you know, put their hands down on the computer, which, is, which could be fraudster behavior or an actual name. Now, if you just train a gibberish generator on your data, then because we have majority American merchants, and the majority American merchants have majority white names, then you're going to train this model to think of names as white names, you know, John Smith. And then someone comes from a, not a white name, such as someone from an Asian country, and suddenly, the gibberish generator thinks that's gibberish. But it's not gibberish, it's just not a white American name. And then, what happens? If you're not careful, then you're training your model against minorities, right? If you're not careful with your features and with your models, you're going to train them against minorities. I'm going to give you another example. This is an actual order of Riskified, um, anonymized, but it's an actual order. What you see here uh, is a lot of information. I'm going to walk you through what's important. Um, this is an order from October, okay? Um, there is an Asian uh, person in Toronto, Canada, buying a very high amount order uh, for $1,000, over $1,000, a parka. It's a warm, warm coat. Um, with an email that's uh, UToronto, that's the Toronto University's email address. That's very new. It was created four months ago um, with a credit card that's from China. And shipping it to an address, if you see in our linking table uh, here, uh, to an address that has other orders with, also with UToronto email domain. Now, for the human eye, this is a very easy, ad, easy order, right? He's an immigrant or a foreign student in Canada. It's October, it's getting cold, he's freezing his butt off, he's ordering a coat, right? He has a Chinese credit card because he's from China, right? Makes sense. What does the computer see? What does the model see? The model sees very far IP, sees a new email address with no... Uh, no history, it sees a foreign bin with no reason, it sees an address with kind of suspicious links, you can see that we have a chargeback at that address, so someone submitted a chargeback. It, it just, with a high amount, with someone who doesn't have history in our system, we decline. Okay, what happens then? You decline every single immigrant, you decline every single foreign student. So it's very important to think about these edge cases in your data, data, set, data set when you are training your model. So what do we do at Riskify? First, we use multi-layer sampling. In addition to the naive sampling that will bring the majority, we manually um, end with scripts over sample segments where we know that we need to be careful and we need to pay more attention. Second, we never dispute fraud. I don't know if you know this, but once you submit a, submit a chargeback, meaning you call your bank and say, it wasn't me, it still can be disputed. So if we at Riskify believe that that was a fraudulent order, we never dispute it. Even if we have a good chance of winning. You know, that lovely old lady, it was from her computer. We could submit a, charge, we could submit a dispute and say like, oh, but it was her computer, it was her credit card, da da da. But we never do that. We don't dispute chargebacks where we believe that they are uh, because of fraud. Third, customer outreach. Um, we both allow customers to reach out to the merchants for secondary review. And thus, as you heard, we are also actively reaching out to customers to learn about what's happening. Finally, enrichment. We use uh, data enrichment companies to get more information. And we also use behavior features that are helping us get a more nuanced um, understanding of the order. For example, we could see if someone's computer was uh, overtaken from afar and the order was placed like that. To summarize, um, these are the four things that are, I think are very important. First, keep your tools refined. Um, train your models, train your features properly, pay attention to how the minorities are working, what's the legitimate behavior of those minorities, and make sure that your model knows that. Second, stay vigilant. We at Riskified are constantly monitoring trends, 
We are monitoring ongoing scams, phishing attacks against our merchants, both on the clear web and in the dark web, to know what's going on. Third, educate your partners. For us at Riskified, one of the best partners are the customer service agents at, at the merchant side. Those people that pick up the phone when you call, because they are the people who can stop you know, uh, social engineering, they can identify fraud. They can identify a victim who is sounding unsure about what's going on. So we, if, for example, the merchant financially motivates these uh, agents to stop fraud for every fraudulent order they catch, then they are going to be your partners in stopping these. And finally, protect the vulnerable. For example, we don't dispute fraud, but also you can put up stops on your website about ongoing scams like, are you being contacted on the phone by Microsoft to purchase this item? Stop, that's a scam. That will protect them. And this is really the message that I want you to take home from here, which is I strongly believe that we have a social responsibility to protect these vulnerable marginalized communities. Luckily for us, and also for employers, this is also our business interest. Thank you very much for listening and for coming. <laughs>